That's what you need. Well, for that, with the pack, I think it should be fine, right? Oh, yeah, I would, you know, one way to, what I do when I'm teaching, just in case I am alone, just run down the, no, I just run down the brightness, because that's the one you want to be concerned with. Right, and that's not going to be. And you don't really have it here. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to the Energy Symposium this week. Uh, we're about halfway through the semester, I think. Uh, this afternoon, we've got the pleasure of having Maria Gallucci with us. Maria is an Energy Journalism Fellow at UT Energy Institute this year. She's our third Energy Journalism Fellow. This is the third year we've been running this program. It's kind of interesting. Finally, we got someone who uh, was young and somewhat intelligent. Uh, our previous ones. <laughs> Very intelligent. Russell Gold from the Wall Street Journal. Russell was our first one. He was pretty good. I think Russell gave a talk two years ago when he was here. And then we had Lauren Matlon last year. I think he gave a talk as part of his year in residence as well. So uh, I don't know. I thought of Lauren and uh, Russell as, as ugly old guys. But it, it's nice to have Maria for a change job. It's nice to have somebody young in the office with maybe some better ideas than us old farts in the office. Uh, Maria is going to talk to us today about cutting carbon in maritime cargo shipping. Uh, like I said, she is a journalist. She's worked in Mexico and Guatemala. Yeah. Okay. And Honduras. Uh, she comes to us from New York City. You don't bring an accent, do you? No. Okay. Uh, she's written and worked for, well, you are young, Mashable. I have no idea what that is. is Mashable, is that a magazine or an internet thing? or? Inter yeah, let's see, I'm old. Uh, Inside Climate News, International Business Times, I recognize those. And Makeshift, uh, she's had articles in uh, the Associated Press, Reuters, Bloomberg, all those things I do understand. Uh, she's had several awards and accolades over the years, as young as she is. So I think this will be really interesting. She's recently visited Panama and Costa Rica, looking into some of these issues with maritime shipping. And uh, I think you'll find this interesting. Also, she's agreed to join us after the talk this evening over at Varsity Pizza. If you'd like to continue the discussion, we'll be over there probably starting around 6.30, 6.45. So with that, Maria, it's all yours. Okay. Does this sound like this is on? All right. Great. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, so, uh, you know, I, as it says, I'm the Energy Journalism Fellow. And what that means basically is that for this next year, I'll be spending um, – all of my time looking into this topic, you know, in a newsroom environment, in my day job, I would spend, you know, maybe a day on a story. If I'm lucky, I might have a couple weeks to develop a big feature, but nothing like this. So uh, this is a really great opportunity because I'll get to understand a lot of the complexities and the nuances and uh, talk to folks in the Energy Institute uh, and, and other places around campus to understand, better understand this topic. Um, my ultimate goal while I'm here is to hopefully uh, sign a, a contract with a publisher uh, to write a nonfiction book. Uh, my goal would be to write kind of like a narrative, something that's focused more on the people and the stories and sort of the, the color rather than um, more academic or technical. That's not really my area of expertise, but I do like telling stories. And... Um, so over the next year, I'll be researching, learning how things work, who the players are, what policies are needed to move this industry forward, and what ultimately this all means for the health of our planet. So there is me, uh, I'm kind of blurry, but last week at the Miraflores Locks in Panama Canal, I'm actually standing on the gates uh, to the main canal, and there's a big car carrier behind me, so uh, that was fun to do. Um, so tonight's symposium, uh, as you might be able to tell, will be a little bit different because I'm not a professor or an engineer or a scientist. Those are the types of people that I interview to write my stories. Um, so uh, that's a big advantage of being here at UT is talking to these types of folks. And uh, certainly uh, after the presentation or even during, if you have 
things that you're working on. If you're familiar with this area, I'd love to hear it as well uh, to, to advance the discussion in that way. So people in the shipping industry, when they're talking amongst themselves or they meet an acquaintance, they'll say, you know, how did you get the shipping bug? That's how they talk about it, uh, sort of this fascination with shipping. And people usually respond in one or two ways. Either they got it through family, you know, their, their parents were marine engineers or naval officers, or they just sort of stumbled into it. They had this passing curiosity, and all of a sudden they were just steeped in this world. And I think that kind of reflects how the industry thinks about itself. They, you know, there's a lot of people who maybe find shipping boring or they don't think about it or they're super fascinated by it. And shipping kind of sees itself as this forgotten middle child, even though, you know, they move $4 trillion worth of goods every year, something like 80 to 90% of everything that we use, everything that's traded, moves on a cargo ship at some point. Uh, but most of us, you know, it's out of sight, out of mind. Maybe we don't live near ports or we just, you know, it's not that interesting. But, but I caught the shipping bug the second way, not because of family, but because I just kind of stumbled into it. And that started around two years ago when I was working at International Business Times at the time uh, in New York, writing on energy and environment issues. And an editor of mine sent me this article uh, to a British newspaper, or a British newspaper article, and it said that, um, sailing cargo ships were back in vogue as a green alternative. And that, you know, meaning like the ships that we used centuries ago before we had uh, steamships or diesel engines. So a ship like that. Um, and the article explained how there's this movement of people who are turning uh, century, year old, century old ships uh, into modern cargo vessels powered by mostly the wind. Maybe they have a backup engine. And the idea is you take your fair trade coffee, your organic chocolate, and you bring it from the Caribbean to the other side of the world, uh, emitting as few carbon or as little carbon as possible. It's like the farm to table movement in overdrive. Uh, the ship shown here is called the Aventure, which means adventure in Dutch. And it's been going between the Americas and Europe for the last year. And I actually uh, met up with the ship in Honduras when it was uh, picking up some organic coffee. So. There's a little collage that I made. Um, so obviously this is kind of pie in the sky. It's not actually going to replace container ships and it's not going to transform the industry. Um, but I just find it really interesting. It kind of is that, that hook maybe that introduces some people to this industry. Um, you know, a ship like this, the Aventure, can carry a few containers worth of cargo, whereas the biggest ships can carry more than 10,000 containers and get there in maybe like a quarter of the time. So what this, this movement is about, what these sailors are trying to do, is uh, make a statement about the shipping industry to say, you know, they want us to think about our inexpensive t-shirts, our bananas, our medicine, our electronics, where all of this come from, and what are the environmental consequences associated with it. Uh, so I'll just gloss over a few because uh, there's, there's plenty of different avenues to go down. But, um, there's toxic air pollution from the heavy fuel that most ships use, and that can increase uh, health, risks, health risk in communities near ports. A 2009 study found that uh, cargo ships emit enough soot to equal half the pollution from all the cars in the world. Um, it's a graphic from an old story of mine. Um, black carbon, in particular, is a growing area of concern, especially in the Arctic, because not only is it a greenhouse gas, but when it lands on the polar ice, it can accelerate melting. And then there's noise pollution from container ships, uh, which mess up uh, the sonar systems that whale and dolphins use. Um, tonight, though, I'm just going to focus mainly on greenhouse gas emissions, since my, the top of, of my fellowship is decarbonization. And uh, just for background, I'm framing things in terms of the mainstream scientific consensus on human-caused global warming, that is, our energy use, our agricultural production, our tendency to chop down trees, all of that, uh, produces greenhouse, or emits greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, causes the planet's air and water temperatures to warm, has all of these consequences like rising sea levels, intensifying storms, et cetera. Uh, so in 2015, nearly 200 countries, almost the entire world, signed the Paris Climate Agreement, and they set a goal of keeping global warming to well below 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, 2 degrees Celsius, uh, above pre-industrial levels by the end of the century. To do that, it means we effectively need to eliminate all the emissions, or most of the emissions, from the energy sector, or at least offset them, uh, by the end of the century. So in that context, you know, that's how we're thinking about uh, what to do with emissions from the maritime sector. 
So right now, uh, maritime shipping it makes up a relatively small uh, slice. It's about 2 to 3 percent of the world's carbon emissions, which is on, puts it on par with a country like Germany or Japan. Um, so nearly all of those emissions come from burning oil during operations. And the majority of ships use what's called heavy fuel oil or bunker fuel, which is basically kind of the bottom dregs of the uh, petroleum refining process. It has higher carbon, higher sulfur uh, content compared to other fuels, but it's also very cheap and easy to access. Um, so industry leaders are starting to publicly embrace this challenge. They're starting to talk about you know, what to do with our carbon emissions. But in day-to-day -day operations, many people are still ambivalent. So I'll explain some of the political and economic uh, context to help us understand the challenges uh, that are facing technology development. And I'll, of course, get into the technology too. So 2 to 3% of emissions doesn't sound like that much. And actually, compared to other modes of transporting goods like uh, trucking or rail, uh, cargo shipping is the most energy efficient mode. So a lot of people say, you know what, reducing emissions in the cargo sector is not really our priority. We've got to worry with sulfur emissions, about sulfur emissions, about other environmental impacts. We can deal with carbon later. Uh, so this desire speaks to the fact that there really aren't any easy answers. There's not a one-size-fits-all solution for shipping. And when we think about who should be responsible, who should be uh, regulated, it's kind of hard to point the finger in this industry. Um, Ship owners could commission a more eco-friendly ship, but then they'd likely have to charge higher freight rates, and that would uh, make them less competitive unless there's sort of a, a climate policy. And the shipbuilder isn't going to build anything you know, above and beyond unless that they've been uh, ordered to do so or they're, they're being paid to do so. Um, and how do you regulate a vessel that touches multiple countries and jurisdictions in a, a single trip? Ship owners often don't even register in the, the countries where they're based. They uh, register in other countries. The kind of pejorative term is flags of convenience in countries like Panama, Marshall Islands, Liberia, which have far less <coughs> restrictive uh, regulations and tax policies. So the owners might not even operate their own ship either. They can contract it out. And all of this complicates the enforcement of policies. Excuse me. Mm. So this is a flags of convenience, and you can see that Panama is the clear winner despite being a, a tiny country. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this, these complexities are a big part of the dynamic when we talk about regulating the shipping uh, industry's emissions. Um, and then on top of all that, added into the mix, the industry is <clears throat> struggling uh, financially. They're, there's a kind of huge trend of bankruptcies and consolidations right now. You might have heard about the South Korean company Hanjin. Um, it filed for bankruptcy last year, left more than $15 billion worth of goods and its crew stranded in the middle of the sea um, for a few weeks. So money is tight. Financials are in turmoil. People don't feel like taking risky bets right now. Um, but that said, within shipping, there's a growing contingent of people who say that there's a danger in waiting any longer to start working on these clean shipping technologies because it's so complicated, because it will take so long. The longer we delay, the harder it will be, um, especially in the context of you know, the world economy growing, the population growing. We're going to need more ships. So these are projections from the International Maritime Organization, which is the UN body that regulates shipping. And they've said that shipping's emissions could rise anywhere between 50 to 250 percent by 2050 uh, in a business as usual scenario if we keep using today's technology. That, if that happens, that threatens to erase some of the progress that we might see in other industries like ground transportation and electricity, which are much farther on the uh, clean energy curve. So if that plays out, if that scenario plays out, then shipping would account for 17 percent of the world's carbon emissions and you know, up from 3% today, uh, the European Parliament says. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm not <laughs> used to speaking this long. Uh, so we see the industry is already heading in that direction, actually. Between 2013 and 15, total fuel consumption by cargo ships rose 2.4% and emissions increased as well. That's despite the fact that ships are becoming more energy efficient compared to uh, older models. So the International Council on Clean Transportation said 
a greater demand for shipping, increase the overall distances that were traveled. Ships are also going faster, so they're less fuel efficient. And that kind of offsets some of the gains. So on the left here, you see uh, changes in carbon intensity, which is measured as emissions per unit of transport supply. And on the right is total carbon emission, uh, change in total carbon emissions. So the argument of clean energy proponents is that it's going to take a long time to develop the solutions. You know, we need to start on this now. So what are some of those solutions? Uh, within the industry, there's a lot of interest around liquefied natural gas, or LNG, uh, especially as that fuel becomes more available. This is a photo of the Isla Bella, which is the world's first LNG-powered container ship. It launched in 2015, <clears throat> and it uh, travels between Jacksonville, Florida, and Puerto Rico. In a super oversimplified explanation, marine LNG engines tend to be dual fuel, which means they can switch automatically between LNG or bunker fuel as needed, and the LNG is stored on the vessel in insulated heavy tanks. Here's a breakdown of how uh, LNG fuel compares to heavy fuel oil, or bunker fuel HFO here. So LNG doesn't just lower carbon emissions, it lowers uh, harmful sulfur, sulfur oxide, nitrous oxides, SOx and NOx. Um, shipping companies, uh, sort of what the big discussion is about right now is um, a new cap on the sulfur allowed in marine fuel that goes into effect in 2020, which is causing a lot of anxiety about, you know, how are we going to do that? How much is the fuel going to cost? And then on top of that, port and harbor authorities are cracking down on local air pollution um, <clears throat> with emission control areas. So, you know, when you enter this area, you need to switch to a cleaner fuel, et cetera. So in this context, LNG looks pretty attractive. Oh, uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Is that a per ship or per company or per class of ship? And do you know how that's going to be levied against the fuel industry? That's actually a good question. I'm not sure. I, I know the cap is 0.5% um, sulfur limit on the fuel. And I'm, that's a good question um, in terms of who's going to be responsible for that. Right, exactly. Any ship that's using the bunker fuel or, you know, any fuel. Um, so almost all major shipping companies, including cruise ships, have launched some kind of LNG-powered commercial vessel or they're in the process of doing so. This is from March 2016, so presumably the numbers might be different, uh, maybe a little higher. There are 77 LNG-fueled ships, uh, not including the uh, LNG carriers that actually move it around. And next year, the number um, of LNG-fueled or LNG-capable ships could reach 208. But there are some big challenges, of course, in making LNG more prominent marine fuel. Uh, the biggest among them is the lack of fueling infrastructure and the challenges of storing LNG on the ship. Only about a dozen ports so far can supply LNG-fueled ships, though there's many more projects in the works, including one in Louisiana. Um, ports, energy companies, and shippers will need to spend billions um, to build this necessary infrastructure and take it mainstream. So there's a lot of excitement around LNG, but some are still skeptical that it will take off because of this. And um, there's a contingent of people who are saying, you know what, let's not go all in on LNG because ultimately it still is a fossil fuel. It still is, you know, there still are greenhouse gas emissions associated with it. Why make this investment if we're going to have to make another one later? Um, so one view is that, you know, if the real goal is to decarbonize, then maybe LNG isn't the way to go, although as you can see, there's, there's kind of a divided camp on that. Um, so this other, this kind of more progressive group, they want to see what they call zero emissions vessels, by which I mean vessels that don't produce greenhouse gas emissions uh, in transit or while waiting at ports. So zero emissions obviously isn't a perfect name because there will likely be emissions associated with the electricity that's stored in the battery or in the production of hydrogen. Um, so these aren't uh, the holy grail, but when we talk about zero emission ships, this is kind of the context. Uh, this graphic is from a survey by Lloyd's Register, which is a, a big maritime company, and University College London's Energy Institute. It shows that 80% of the shipping companies that they talk to agree that zero emission, vessel, uh, zero emission vessels are needed, 
Um, I thought it was kind of funny that they shouldn't cost more than 10% or increase costs by 10%. Uh, my hunch is that they might. Um, but, uh, and, and then this is not some far off future that they're talking about. They're saying that reliability and scalability, um, you know, technology should be proven and validated by 2030. Um, so they mean uh, these types of ships should be entering the mainstream market within, you know, about a decade. And then as older ships retire, new ships are built, they're kind of turn over the fleet, will need to fully decarbonize by 2050. Uh, so companies uh, have identified the top three technology options as hydrogen, biofuels, and batteries. And all of these are in pretty early stages of development for cargo ships. And there are a lot of financial, technical, and infrastructure barriers to overcome. But I'm just kind of going to give you an overview of all of them. So we'll start with hydrogen. Um, the most common method for making hydrogen today at large industrial scales is uh, steam methane reforming which causes methane and natural gas to react with steam and produce hydrogen and carbon monoxide. There's a lot of work around renewable methane, uh, so methane captured from landfills or waste streams that would allow you to produce hydrogen more sustainably. Um, that's obviously not at the scale that natural gas is yet. Uh, the second way to make hydrogen is electrolysis, so splitting water into hydrogen and water by using electricity. Uh, so this is a polymer electrolyte membrane fuel cell, which is one of the um, kind of more prominent technologies uh, for using hydrogen. So depending on the process, there are greenhouse gas emissions associated with producing hydrogen, but generally it's considered to result in fewer emissions than petroleum fuels. And the thinking is if we can use renewable methane, if we can use wind and solar for electrolysis instead of coal, hydrogen will be much cleaner. Um, hydrogen can be used in existing internal combustion engines, though this uh, isn't a big area of focus. It's not that efficient. That said, in the UK last year, there was a tiny demonstration project with a catamaran. It used a hydrogen burning engine uh, that took eight hours to circumnavigate a tiny little island, so still experimental. The more efficient way to use hydrogen uh, would be with a fuel cell like this. And that's where uh, most of the conversation is focused, not just for cargo ships, obviously, but electric vehicles, or well, for vehicles. Uh, fuel cells produce electricity by converting hydrogen and oxygen into water, and that electricity could, and shipping could be used for propulsion, moving the vessel, or it could be used for auxiliary power, like onboard electricity use or when it's uh, at the port. In Hawaii, uh, the Energy Department is looking at using fuel cells for cold ironing, which is this process of when the ship uh, is that port, it can plug into the grid or plug into a fuel cell and use that for its electricity instead of its diesel generators. Uh, the world's first fuel cell ship launched in 2009 from Denmark. Uh, it was a demonstration project. It um, ran for a few years. I saw it last year it, it's been idled, but it's not out of commission. Um, and that used a high temperature molten carbon fuel cell. Since then, there's been about two dozen fuel cell projects in the maritime sector, ranging from you know, discussion feasibility studies to actual uh, vessels being tested. And about nine of them focus on hydrogen in particular, including this one, which is obviously a rendering. Um, last year, Sandia National Labs published a feasibility study to determine whether you could build a high-powered or a high-speed uh, passenger ferry completely powered by hydrogen in the San Francisco Bay. They found that, yes, it is possible from a technical and regulatory standpoint. Um, but it's very costly. Of course, it's maybe twice the cost of building a diesel ferry of a comparable size. Uh, and just for a little background, the idea for this ferry began with Tom Escher, who runs a tour boat company uh, called Red and White Fleet. His grandfather founded the company in 1892. Tom bought it in 97. And, you know, in news, news stories, he said he was thinking about the world he'd leave behind to his own grandchildren. And he was getting tired of all the discussions about how to just reduce emissions from diesel emissions. A lot of discussions are on scrubbers and maybe things that you can add to the existing system. And he said, it's great to reduce pollution by 10%, but we're never going to get rid of pollution unless we take an aggressive step. So that spurred his quest to build. Uh, this is called the SF Breeze. Uh, as it's planned now, the ferry would have two electric motors driven by 41 fuel cell units, each with 120 kilowatts. Um, it would use liquid hydrogen. And the project also envisions building a $5 million hydrogen fueling station in the Bay Area. So Sandia Labs is studying how to optimize this design. Uh, Tom is working to try and get money to build it. Um, 
projects like these, though, um, they're, uh, they're a lot of discussions. You don't see a lot of actual build out yet, but maybe that's where the industry's going. Um, hydrogen proponents see a lot of, uh, see recent signs that this technology could be going more mainstream than it might actually catch on. A major marine certification body is developing rules for how ships could integrate hydrogen. And those rules are really important because they need to be able to, you know, meet certain compliance standards. You need to have the backing of an official organization. The International Maritime Organization is looking at fuel cells and its regulatory processes. And then recently, um, companies like Shell, Toyota, Honda, they formed the World Hydrogen Council and kind of made a public commitment to invest in commercializing in hydrogen fuel cells. So that kind of speaks to the mainstream interest. And while we're still a very long way from uh, running entire ships on fuel cells, uh, researchers fi are finding that it's possible to use them for some of this auxiliary power. So electricity use on, on the ship or when you're at the port. So maybe it's a hybrid solution is something we can look forward to. Um, so moving on to the second of the three technologies, uh, biofuels. The idea is here that you would have a fuel that is not derived from fossil fuels not uh, petroleum or natural gas, um, that would still work with a diesel engine or you could blend it um, with existing fuels to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution. Here's something I took from the internet. Um, so of course, well the challenge with biofuels, there's a lot of different places it can come from. Uh, and you could wind up producing just as many emissions or more uh, if your feedstock requires intensive agriculture like uh, corn or palm oil. So biofuel proponents talk about developing sustainable biofuels from waste streams. Um, as much as 10% of the global uh, marine fuel mix could be made, uh, could include sustainable drop in biofuels by 2030. And that's according to a biofuels company, Good Fuel. So um, maybe take that with a grain of salt. Um, I've been talking with this company, Good Fuels. Um, I actually plan to visit their offices next month um, in Amsterdam. I'm going to Europe. Uh, to attend part of the shipping discussions at the UN Climate Conference in Germany and uh, meeting up with some other companies. So that's part of my effort, you know, speaking to the, uh, the Journalism Fellowship to get to know people in this space and kind of understand how their world works. So to focus on good fuels, uh, the company formed in 2015 after splintering off from Sky Energy, which was a venture launched by KLM Airlines to work on aviation biofuels. Um, they recently launched a partnership uh, with an engineering giant, Wartzilla, and the dredging company, Boscalis, um, in Europe. Last year, they tested a 50-50 blend of diesel and a biofuel derived from the uh, pulpy residues of a paper mill. They used the mix in uh, this ship. It's a cutter suction dredger, and what it does is sucks up the hard soil from the lake bottom and pumps it onto the shore. They're uh, actually building artificial islands in the lake in the Netherlands to create wetlands and breeding grounds. So it's kind of a good uh, optics, I guess, for a biofuels project. Uh, they also, Good Fuels also recently won a supply contract with Port of Netherlands, which is one of the world's most important uh, authorities, port authorities. Uh, the contract involves five patrol vessels, and it'll use a mix of 70% diesel, 30% biofuels, and hopefully they think it'll reduce carbon emissions by about a quarter. Uh, so like any clean technology, there's uh, some challenges. Um, the fuels are short in supply. Uh, with today's limited demand, biofuel producers don't have either the incentive or the cash to make large quantities. So it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. Uh, these alternative fuels also generally have a lower energy density compared to, uh, say, bunker fuel, um, which is not necessarily a pr a, as big of a problem for a smaller ship like this one, um, but it would be a concern for a bigger vessel like a container ship. And then costs, of course, are a big barrier. Um, biofuels are more, significantly more expensive than bunker or even LNG. Um, what would improve the business case would be to have some sort of climate policy, something that either puts a price on carbon emissions, regulates carbon in some way, and kind of uh, gives lower carbon fuels a, a leg up. But um, there's discussions. Nothing like that's on the table yet, though. So this is another rendering. It's actually from a video um, produced by the technology giant ABB. It's of a battery-powered ferry. <coughs> ferry. They are actively converting in Sweden um, from diesel engines to battery-powered. And they're also building a shoreside charging station. Uh, the ships are reportedly very close to launching, uh, and that would make them the biggest all-electric ships in the world. 
though that said, it's not, you know, it's not a lot of competition for that title. Uh, and here I'm talking about the civilian world because uh, obviously in the U.S. Navy, other navies, we do have vessels that generate and store their own electricity on board with gas turbines and nuclear. Um, so battery technology, as I'm sure you're all aware, has improved significantly in recent years. They're more efficient. Uh, costs are falling precipitously. They're getting smaller. Uh, and that trend is likely to continue as more uh, research and development spending drives more advancement, more advancement drives lower prices, leads to higher sales, and so on. Uh, so that's just a chart I pulled on um, lithium-ion battery prices. So the, the two Swedish, uh, the two ferries that ABB is working on um, would cover a distance of about two and a half miles between Sweden and Denmark. And ABB says combined battery power for those two ferries would equal about uh, 10,700 car batteries. And I thought this was uh, kind of cool. Uh, the charging station would use 3D laser scanning and wireless communication between the ship and the shore. So as the uh, ferry pulls into the dock, a robot reaches out, grabs the cable, cable reel releases it, and then it kind of connects to the charger that way. Uh, just to name a few other projects, um, there, are battery po there are already battery-powered car ferries in Norway and Finland, like that one. Um, a Norwegian cruise line is investing in ships with a battery hybrid engine uh, to reduce noise pollution when it travels in the Arctic. In Taiwan, a ferry that runs to and from a nearby island is using a lithium iron phosphate battery to reduce its bunker fuel consumption. And so you probably picked up on the fact that these are relatively small vessels making short trips. They can only go so far before they need to recharge their batteries or maybe uh, you know, s switch on that diesel engine. And these types of vessels are likely to be the primary market for battery-powered uh, shipping technologies, at least for now, because they have the advantage of being uh, relatively close to land and they can make frequent stops. So with today's battery technology, um, you know, I was talking to a, a, one of the engineers working on the Swedish ferries, and he said if your vessel is going to make a trip uh, longer than one or two hours, a battery doesn't make sense economically right now. You'd need to have so many batteries, or the logistics of switching those and charging those would just um, be very complicated. Uh, but for shorter trips of an hour or less, two hours, uh, that's much more feasible. And kind of going back to that whole uh, uh, zero emissions concept, it's important to think about you know, the electricity that's charging these batteries. And this is an issue that we see with electric vehicles as well. Um, you know, the question of how clean is an electric car that plugs into a coal-fired electricity grid versus one that uses gasoline. In the case of cars, um, kind of based on recent analyses, the answer seems to be yes. Nearly all US drivers still emit less carbon if they drive an electric car versus a, a non-hybrid gas car. In shipping, um, I'm not aware of calculations like that that have been teased out. Um, but if you think about sort of the trends in the global electricity market where the world is heading, more renewable energy, more natural gas coming online, uh, then you can see how that could ultimately benefit the case for battery-powered ships. And in, in Sweden's case, in the case of Sweden and Norway in particular with air ferries, they already have a lot of hydropower. So in that case, they, you know, they are closer to this zero emissions ideal. Um, so I've glossed over a lot of stuff, and there are lots of other technologies um, that are already helping to cut down on fuel use and cargo shipping, kind of s some from more smaller and more mundane to um, more uh, radical um, startup companies. There's actually a lot of uh, sort of big data, digital information companies entering the maritime space because this industry is still really old school. They'll settle deals uh, you know, with a handshake or um, submit reports by hand, and there's a lot of paperwork. And so the idea is, OK, let's bring them into the 21st century. Maybe we can figure out uh, the shortest routes they can take, the most efficient ways they can move around, and in that way, reduce fuel consumption, just have an overall more efficient operation. I always think it's kind of funny, too. Sometimes, just when I'm reading stories on the industry, you'll see people who lament the fact that um, it's going this direction. They lament the fact that you can't just have a handshake deal anymore. Um, but of course, there are people who are saying maybe there's a better way to do business than that. Um, so another area that's catching on is wind-assisted propulsion, like this one. Um, so this vessel, you see the two tall cylinders are called rotor sails, and those are made by the Finnish company Norse Power. And this is actually a pretty old technology, although you know this new incarnation has is much cheaper, uses much better materials. 
um, it was invented around the 1920s, and they, how they work is that as the wind passes by the spinning rotor sail, so uh, the airflow accelerates on one side and decelerates on the other, and that makes a thrust force that helps propel the ship without using the, uh, the diesel engine. And actually next month, um, I mentioned that trip to Europe, I'll actually be traveling on this vessel. It leaves from Rotterdam, goes to England and comes back. Um, to learn about the technology and also just to kind of experience life at sea for a little bit. Um, and then uh, just to close out some highlights from my recent reporting trip to Central America. This is a large container ship uh, traveling through the newly expanded Panama Canal. So it's, this is the Coca Lee Lock, so it's um, coming in from, the in from the Pacific side, heading out into the Caribbean. Uh, the expansion uh, just finished last year, and it took over $5 billion in more than nine years to complete. And um, the idea is that they could have more ship traffic, they could have much bigger ships come through. And they've seen uh, a record number of ships actually going through the canal. Um, although, funny enough, you know, they expanded it, and now today some container ships are too big to fit through because they, people just keep building bigger ships. Um, this one is called the Ever Living, and it has uh, several energy efficient features like an optimized hull design made from a partic particular type of uh, lightweight steel that kind of helps it um, move through the water better, cuts down on fuel use. It can also do this cold ironing technique of, um, or process of plugging into shore side electrical power. And then also because it is larger, it's, uh, uh, it's not uh, kind of the colossal mega ship, but it is bigger than the average, so that kind of increases your efficiency if it's uh, per unit of goods moved. Um, and this kind of goes back to what I was talking about at the beginning with the sailing cargo vessels. Um, I met up with the founders of a company who are building a sailing cargo vessel from scratch in Costa Rica. Um, so they're using wood that's been sustainably harvested. And here you can see they're, uh, in the background they're cutting planks for the keel, the bottom of the ship. And in the foreground he's just cutting up um, the bark, the kind of scrap pieces. Um, and uh, if they get the funding that they need, they do have a lot of investors, but they sh should be finished in a couple years. And I know that this is kind of fantastical, um, but I found that actually when I talk to people who aren't that familiar with shipping, aren't that familiar with clean energy, this is the thing that they want to know about. It's, I think it's kind of romantic and it's kind of um, it has this adventurous spirit that maybe people connect to. So in terms of thinking about this, from a storytelling perspective, um, as a narrative, this kind of this seems to be the the thing that jumps out more than biofuels or hydrogen, um, and that's honestly how I became interested too. Because I don't, as I said, I don't have the maritime background. And then, um, kind of speaking of the adventurous spirit, uh, this is at the Costa Rica shipyard. It's kind of hard to tell, but uh, these are two tree houses that they built. And when I visited, they hadn't yet built up their accommodations, so I actually slept in one of them. Uh, in a tent, so I just thought that was uh, speaking to the storytelling aspect of it. Um, but yeah, that's that's all I have. Uh, thank you for listening, and uh, happy to answer questions or listen to you if you have anything to add. Thank you. That was a very interesting talk, Maria. Uh, if you had to write a chapter for your book titled The United States as Leader and Laggard on International Maritime Shipping. Which uh, examples would you think of for the ways the U.S. is a leader in this effort, and in which ways is the U.S. a laggard? Hmm, that's a good question. Or are we only a leader or only a laggard or something like that? Yeah. Well, it, I would say maybe that we're a laggard in the sense that a lot of the um, technology development that's coming out is happening in Europe or is happening in uh, China or Japan. Um, the technology I'm familiar with, the development I'm familiar with in the U.S. is more on the digital side, kind of the sort of Silicon Valley-esque approach. Um, certainly in LNG, with LNG production, we're a leader in that sense. Um, a lot of interest coming out of Louisiana and here in Texas as well. Um, but yeah, the U.S., um, I'm not sure that we're, we're the leader in that sense. Maybe we could be because we're certainly uh, some of the biggest, one of the biggest consuming nations. And that's actually an argument too for how do we move the ball forward on this? Well, if the consumers put pressure on the ships, maybe. So that's one way the U.S. could be a leader, but not yet. 
Uh, great talk. Um, I was just curious to, uh, about the prospects of nuclear power cargo shipping because that's a zero uh, emission thing and uh, I feel like that would provide the power density you'd need to uh, actually be able to use it widespread. Um, yeah. So do you know anything about that? Or? Can I deflect to you on that one? <laughs> no. Are there any prospects, like let's say with next gen nuclear or something like that, to where it could go from being cost prohibitive to more cost effective, or is that just not a viable option going forward? During my time, probably not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, um, my question is, when you're looking at those the different pollution and uh, emission, do you uh, consider the life cycle emission? Because uh, one thing that we know is those cargo ships, although they are using bunker fuel, which is dirty, but they are able to achieve some thermal efficiency around 70%, which is one of the highest. But then when looking at those alternatives, uh, you know, do you consider, you know, those, uh, I guess, manufacturing of those uh, lithium batteries or electricity generation, heat, uh, heat loss, and transmission loss. If you combine all those, do you have, a, I guess, a newer picture to see how those alternatives compares to each other? Yeah, that, that's a really important question. I think um, that is, they're still working on the answers to that, but I, I think certainly that should be something that we think about when we're talking about this whole system change. We don't want to spend trillions of dollars to invest in something that will have no ben tangible benefit for the climate or for air quality. Um, so that's kind of why I mentioned things like, you know, thinking about how we make hydrogen, how we produce biofuels, how we're charging the batteries, and then as you're mentioning, to the production of those technologies. So um, those I think are still open questions, but they're very important ones too. So I was just going to ask another question. Um, and maybe you mentioned I missed it. Did you mention the Jones Act? And uh, have you discussed that today? Or is that relevant to what's going on with, with U.S. flagged carriers and that kind of thing? And yeah. I, if no, so, I can, you add, can, you add, can you describe whether that's relevant? And if so, how it's relevant? Yeah, it's, um, it's actually something I haven't looked into too much yet. But the Jones Act is essentially that um, – oh, I'm going to misspeak on this. But a U.S. – it's to do with U.S. flagged ships, and only U.S. flagged ships – can enter U.S. ports. Well, I think it's to go from one U.S. No. port to another U.S. port. You have to be U.S. flagged. U.S. flagship. But right. to go to U.S. port from any other port, you can be flagged however you are, Liberian or whatever. So. Right. Yeah, so I'm not really sure how that factors into this because I haven't looked into it as much. But um, I guess in, in some ways it would be, I know it's a concern for something like Hawaii, you know, where you have to, uh, there might be more efficiencies if you didn't have those types of restrictions. I can see. Well, um, so I'm just speculating because I don't really know. I, I know it's an issue for disaster recovery in Puerto Rico right now. But if you're, um, if we have these requirements for U.S. flagged ships, and Fred will, I'm sure will correct me if I'm wrong, um, the net effect by most observers is that U.S. shipping is not super innovative on improving performance or lowering costs because it's, it ends up being like a protectionism or a protectionist situation. And as a consequence, um, U.S. shipbuilders are not that numerous and not that interested in improving things. And that's one reason why we might be a lagger. But if you combine the Jones Act together with domestic requirements for how U.S. flagged ships might behave, and there aren't that many U.S. flagged ships also, right. then that could put U.S. into a leadership position. And so right now, the, the Jones Act looks to me like an inhibitor for U.S. shipping. There aren't that many U.S. flagged ships except to serve sort of domestic porting requirements. And, um, and the domestic requirements could be a strength if coupled with other requirements for, say, reducing emissions and that kind of thing. I'm completely speculating. I really don't know. But um, a lot of people I know who are smart about shipping complain about the Jones Act as some sort of antiquated thing mm -hmm. that isn't really helping U.S. shipping but might help U.S. shipbuilders. Mm, right. Does that 
Does that seem fair, Fred? Labor costs, that kind of thing. Yeah. South Korea and countries like that are major Yeah, but so generally speaking, the Jones Act is not good for consumers, not good for shippers, um, but good for shipbuilders, which might have some national security benefit. There's maybe some benefit there, um, but I, I wonder if there's some way this ties in with your work you're doing. Yeah, oh, certainly, and that would be interesting to look at because the who does, why do we have it? Who does it benefit? How does it hurt us? Yeah, and, and is it a problem going forward, or is it a potential lever? Right. that could be used to put the U.S. in a leadership position on this. Mm -hmm. Good question. <laughs> well, thank you, Thanks.